So for our next speakers, we have uh, John, Mark, and Brittany from Fannie Mae, who are going to talk about uh, DevSecOps and open source contributions. I'm very excited to hear what they have to say, uh, especially in the context of a regulated financial institution, um, which I happen to work at, um, because a lot of what we must do turns out to be things that are good things that everybody should do. So with that, while you get connected here. Yeah, awkward moment. Wait. Oh, it works! Yay! Okay, well, thank you. you. Take it away, John, Mark, Brittany. Hi. Thanks. All right, we're gonna get into some presentation. All right, here. cool. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm John Mark Walker. I'm from Fannie Mae, and this is my Brittany Eisenhuis, also Fannie Mae. Yeah, I love being like the the last obstacle between a conference attendee and lunch. Uh, so that's awesome. We'll see what we can do here. It's almost, but not quite as bad as being the last obstacle between a conference attendee and happy hour. But uh, luckily, that's not the issue here. So I want to talk about controlling your DevSecOps journey through open source. I want to talk about what that means. And so in order to get into that conversation, let's go ahead and go, yes, this slide. So I want to talk about the open source software lifecycle. And I, I have to give, I have to poke a little bit at the DevSecOps community here because most of the time when we have DevOps conversations, and, this, and today is really um, no different from a lot of other DevOps uh, community events I've been at. Most of the conversation focuses on things like automation, breaking silos, mm -hmm. uh, better data. And to the extent that we talk about the SEC and DevSecOps, it's usually around incident response. How do we get better data? How do we find out what's in our stuff? And all that stuff. Um, in my mind, this is kind of a, a blind spot. Because if you look at the left side of this diagram, when you think about all the open source components we use throughout our infrastructure, it's significant. And so, most of the time, when we talk about how we use open source software and how it flows into our software development lifecycle, uh, for the most part, it's kind of a what we call roach motel, right? Software goes in, but it doesn't come out. Usually, <laughs> usually, usually, we use a lot of open source software. But how many of us, if you have a, if you're the, um, uh, if you're if you're not like this, you can raise your hand. But how many of us work for companies that have a really good program for contributing fixes? back to the um, originating open source pieces that we use. OK, I would definitely want to talk to you after, afterwards. Because uh, for the most part, what I find is that a lot of companies don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to talk about today is why it's a good idea to go upstream, um, why it's a good idea to look at the source of the software. Uh, we'll look at some of the challenges to doing that. Um, we'll look at kind of the first steps you can take along that journey. And then we'll talk about, you know, just to show that we're not complete hypocrites, what we're doing, some things that we're doing at Fannie Mae uh, to start down this journey. Uh, we're certainly not done with this journey, but um, we, we're taking some concrete steps that I want to talk to you about and how we're doing it and what we'll do next after that. So. Yeah. And so leading on to that, so what can we learn from open source communities? So we have our core principles. You have your transparency. You have your open participation. You have your governance, right? But it's also deeper than that. It's also about cross collaboration. It's team building. It's all of these things that come together in order to make a strong project. And so that's the importance of open source and what we're trying to do today. Cool. Yeah, we're going to talk about um, all the different pieces that make up a good open source strategy and kind of like how it can flow into you know, everything else that you're doing. And so when we talk about going upstream and, and fixing problems at the source, I love to cite this case study that was done by the World Bank um, about their GeoNode project that they funded, uh, I think, in the mid-2010s, like 2015, 2016 is when they started, maybe even earlier than that. They funded a study led by Carl Fogel, if you know who that is, because um, they wanted to find out, they felt that they had a really good community result of the their you know, funding of the project, but they wanted to quantify what was the result. What did we get back for the resources that we put into this? And what they found was that you know, the headline stat was there's a 2x return on investment, that when you invest in open source collaboration, you're going to get 2x back from what you put in. OK, that's great. Nice headline statistic. But that wasn't the most important thing to me. The most interesting thing to me was 
not like the, the overall return, it was how they invested the resources. Most of us tend to think that when you put in resources, you just add more coders and it becomes the, um, you know, the, uh, you could, the old adage about you know, adding more people makes things faster, but it really doesn't. But when they looked at the actual distribution of resources that they, they invested in it, only 57% were core engineering, like actual coding. There was a significant amount of that, over 40%, that was non-engineering, the things around um, community building, documentation, events, community facilitation. Uh, that was a significant amount of the resources, and it kind of tells us that whenever we think about how to enable collaboration, enabling cl collaborating with the upstream uh, communities, it's not just about coding. And I want to get into how you can actually structure uh, your programs to, to do this more effectively. So now that we've talked about how great upstream is, and we've talked about why you should do it, uh, why don't we see more companies upstream? This is a question that I wanted to answer for, for years. Um, I've been in open source communities for over 20 years. And one thing I noticed was that whenever I go to open source conferences, Whenever I go to open source communities, whenever I look at what's online, you know, when I looked at the actual contributors, the people writing the code, many, many of them came from the usual suspects. They're software vendors, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. But when it came to what I would call users, companies that make use of the open source software, a lot of times the large enterprises just weren't there. And so the question is, why was this the case? If it's so good, and if it's so obvious that you get the return on your investment, why doesn't it happen more often? And I think over the last five years, I've dug into this problem. I've come up with a pretty good idea of why that, that is the case. I mean, for one thing, in a lot of enterprises, the, um, there is no right access to, say, GitHub. If you want to make a contribution to a GitHub repository, there's no functional way for you to actually do that because it's been shut off. If you want to collaborate on external documents, getting back to the stat about you know, the over 40% is non-code, well, it turns out, if you wanna, even if you want to make contributions that are non-code, a lot of times that's blocked as well. Um, things, simple things like talking to someone on Slack, a lot of times that's not, block, that, a lot of times that's not possible either. Mm -hmm. And so what it all adds up to is this idea where you're using a bunch of software, but you have zero visibility or little visibility and no actual influence over the, um, the software that you're using. This is, and what we're gonna talk about is how can you get started to kind of like break this down? So we've been, I've been at Fannie Mae for over a year now. And so one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, we've, like many of you, we've instituted better security practices around our software. Uh, so things like, you know, we, we have a scanning architecture. Every, all the dependencies that flow into our build systems have to be scanned. They go through a, an SCA scanner. Um, I think pretty common practice at this point. Everyone does this, right? <laughs> so, so I don't know. Uh, somebody laughed. I hope that isn't a bad sign. All right. Um, so uh, most of us do this. Uh, but uh, what we've noticed is that a lot of times, and I think that actually I, I really like the slim.ai uh, data point that she fact checked a minute ago about 20% um, of open source components in the popular uh, containers are high and critical vulnerabilities. And so you know, we find the same things, right? And so when we look at this, we've noticed that sometimes there's no like, available patch for these high and critical vulnerabilities. And so what we found is that you know, because there's no patch, our developers are stuck. And the thing that we've had to deal with is how do we address that problem? And we're gonna walk through some of the um, dependencies that we're looking at and how we're addressing that. But a moment here about, you know, is open source scary? And again, great, fact to, to check here about the 20% with high and critical vulnerabilities. Um, you know, it's, it's great that we're talking about supply chain security. You know, I've been talking about, you know, supply chain management for ever since 2013, I think, is when I first started talking about it. Um, you know, we all remember Equifax. We all remember Log4j, for sure. Um, we're coming up on the one year anniversary in a couple of months. But it's good to like kind of pull back and look <laughs> sorry I, I know people miss christmas for that so i, I really don't want to <laughs> no no ptsd here um <laughs> sorry about that uh but when you look at when you pull back and you look at the overall picture open source is still more secure because of the transparency and i got this quote directly from gartner who was telling me that uh you know 
we know that what's we know the vulnerabilities that are in our open source software because we have ultimate access to it and we can actually see that so at the end of the day yeah there's some scary things but at least we have the ability to uh, address them and so the the point here is you know stop letting things happen to you mm -hmm. and take the steps so that you can prevent them from happening to you that's the overall message that i'm getting to here you can start with just like let's create a, an inner source system you know, inner sources, open source principles done behind a firewall. Let's start with an inner source system where we're patching these things and making them available, at least for our enterprise, right? That's one way you can start. You have access to the source. You, I'm sure you have competent engineers throughout your companies that could actually uh, start to engage in this way and actually make a difference for the people throughout, you know, in your engineering teams. Start there. At least then you don't have to get into the, the scary outside world, but it's a good place for, for you to get started. But then the thing is, that's one way, right? That's the starting point. But when you think about the whole upstream concept, there's a great book I want to check here um, by Dan Heath. It's called Upstream. And it talks about addressing problems at their source and how it's actually difficult for us as humans to do that. One of the, one of the examples pulled from the book was a, a literal example of a river running downstream carrying pollutants and how all the different municipalities had to deal with these um, issues duplicating effort, all solving it the same way. And then someone, at some point, made the obvious conclusion, why don't we work together and solve this at the source? So it's a great example of like a really simple thing that should have been done in the first place. But because we as humans are really programmed to think about addressing problems as they happen to us, we have to change our thinking to look at what happens upstream. So, so let's go from, let's, the starting point was inner source. How can we take that a step further? Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about something we're doing called the Clean Dependency Project, where we look at taking this concept of patching these dependencies internally, but why don't we just patch them externally? There's nothing preventing us from doing that except our own processes, but we'll get into that. Um, but let's, let's, if we can fix it for ourselves, let's work with others and fix it there as well. I think all of this will benefit, so. Tag. Okay. So, so what steps are we taking to build this proactive open source community? And so that's what we're going to talk about today is some of the, the journeys that we are on trying to solve this problem within our company and when being able to extend it all to you. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, we're fortunate enough, but you need to build partnership with your stakeholders. Unfortunately, you know, we all don't work for ourselves. We all have multiple stakeholders that we have to deal with from legal, we have security, we have intellectual property, we have all of these folks that we have to deal with in a good way. But you need to build that partnership. And so building that rapport is so important when you're going to build this proactive solution so things no longer just happen to you and you have to solve it. So, you know, you're looking at your developers and you're looking and you're thinking and your technologists can they push upstream? Well, we don't know, but guess what? That can be trained. I remember the first time I pushed upstream for the first time, I was like, whoa. And it got accepted. I was like, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. Why aren't more people doing this? And so that's something that you need to bring in is that sort of training, which is fantastic. And then, oh yeah, so and then we're building the partnerships and getting all of our approvals. So we have to unlock these external tools. You know, not having access to Slack or Discord or any sort of other format or Google Docs really hinders the development when you have to use your personal device to do this, to do that, go here, and then just cross-track all of that. So we're working on a process to unlock that, as well as we're like finding subject matter experts that are so involved in these communities already, like SpringWeb, um, Pandas, Spring Web Security, Spring Security, and then there's one more that I'm forgetting Jackson right now. Databind. Jackson Data Bind. Jackson Data Yep. And so we're bringing these folks together to start finding these fixes and then be able to bring them into our repositories and then push them upstream and hopefully the community takes it. So yeah, so basically we're providing this to upstream communities and then that way all of you would be able to consume this as well. Yeah, and we're, we're blessed with having really good legal and yeah. risk partners that are truly partners in this journey, mm -hmm. I highly recommend that you find your partners in the spaces outside of engineering that can help you unlock mm -hmm. the things that you need to do. Yeah, and it's always like a good strategy too to come with them with a detailed plan. This is what we're trying to do 
this is how we want you to get involved, as opposed to just putting time on their calendar saying, hey, let's talk about this. If you go in with a plan, they are so appreciative. And so now we're going to start building community. This journey is happening. So working with these core repositories like Pandas, Jackson Databind, we're starting to try to find folks in these communities, the, the core committers, the core maintainers, and trying to help them with what they're doing. So if any of you are working on these projects, hello, please come visit us. And so we want to establish this partnership. We want to establish that trust because so many companies take, 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 take from open source software, and we want to give back, especially give back to the maintainer, so that's very important. And you know, we want to keep our internal developers engaged. We don't want them to consistently have to reinvent the wheel, solve all of these problems, and have to do this all the time. So we want to make sure that they're engaged, knowing that they're making a difference. And then also, we're establishing clear governance rules. Giving back upstream from a large financial services firm is complicated. It's very tricky, but if you know and build that rapport with your stakeholders, you can make it happen. And we're about to be doing exactly that. Cool. It's exciting. And then, so yeah, what we're doing at Fannie Mae, we're launching this project, the Clean Dependency Project. This is a wonderful space where we have other companies that are trying to monetize these sorts of fixes and sell them back to you. <laughs> no, we're going to give it away for free. That's open source. That's the most important thing. And so, you know, Integrating dependency fixes using existing CI plans and processes. We are, you know, creating new solutions across all external products. So it's a very exciting time. Yeah, so this is all about it solves our immediate problem, but we think it can be helpful for yeah. I know that many of you have these exact same issues. And so this is all about expanding and making it mm -hmm. uh, some making solutions that, you know, will be uh, helpful for you as well. To be consumed and contributed back to. And then so next steps, we, we have brave volunteers that are going to be leaping off of the cliff into the open source space unknown. They're going to start working and they have time dedicated from leadership to just give back to projects, which is so exciting. Right now we're testing and we're learning and then we already have more technologists that want to get on board. They're like, we have never seen anything like this at this company. Hello, please, can we come work with you? And we're like, absolutely. So that's super exciting. And just putting this out there in the universe, we are hiring an entire squad of open source only developers and maintainers to work on this project. So if you were interested. If you ever wanted to learn how to be an open source maintainer. Yeah. And we're pretty cool. <laughs> I mean. If we say so ourselves. I mean, yeah, right? I got Spicoli shoes on, you know, living the best life. So yeah, it just, it's, it's really great. So, you know, we're launching. It's great. Um, we're stoked. We're happy that you all wanted to hear this talk and share the journey, but here's our repo. Give it a follow. Make it public. Do what you want to do. But yeah, welcome. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you about you know, ideas that you have, any other dependencies you want to add to it. Um, yeah. we're, we're working on the overall you know, contribution process, like how you can participate, but that is the goal to have it uh, uh, open to uh, everyone that wants to participate. So. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. As, as Brittany mentioned, we are hiring. So we've got a team of engineers we're putting together. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about how we can do that more effectively and to, to really kind of like drive this forward. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Any, I guess we have time for a couple questions. Do we? Yeah. I, I don't know, do we? Wait, hang on. I think we okay. do. I'm getting the head nod, so I'm thinking that yes. We, oh, yes. Yeah. No. The contribution takes many forms, right? There's there's the code, there's the there's the documentation, there's the community building, there are events like this. There there are many ways to contribute time and effort that leads to the result that we want. And money is certainly one of them. I think one of the things that we found is that the money issue really only applies to a certain specific set of maintainers. It's definitely something there that we want to help fix, but it's probably the easiest thing to fix. Mm -hmm. um, but the larger issue is really around process, governance, and just getting people's mindset to change so that we think about you know, solving the problems upstream uh, first. So, uh, hang on, so we'll, we'll start here and then you in the back, so you first. Hi, quick question, what is Pandas and Jackson's security plan? Jackson data mine. So, 
if you if you work with build systems frequently, you, you'll find that these will often these are often the dependencies that bite you because they have specific. Or I guess they're tagged as critical vulnerabilities, even though there is some pandas is a data science library, Python. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Jackson DataBind is a common component used for. I can't remember. <laughs> Someone help me out. Uh, but but essentially, what happens is that their label is critical. The communities that produce them disagree with that assessment, especially if you look at Pandas. It comes down to the underlying uh, Python pickle uh, data. Uh, uh, so because of that, the, some of the libraries get categorized as critical, even though there's nothing, like there's no available patch to replace it. The communities say it's not an issue, but it'll be fixed in the next version anyway. Uh, the, the SCA scanning tools say it's critical. Mm -hmm. so, how, you know, instead of like getting into that argument, okay, why don't we actually modify these libraries directly, take out the part that, you know, is flagged by um, scanners as critical, and then let's publish it, you know, publicly. And we already have like, our Python engineers have already devised solutions that we're going to be posting publicly so that we can um, yep. help. That was one of our uh, first ones. Yeah. Yeah, was that solution that got, <laughs> went right on through. Everyone's really happy about it. And then I think the gentleman in the back, We haven't yet. We haven't. Just to be clear. Yeah. Just to be clear. We have a solution. We, we just. But yeah, we're we're actually so we're next, as part of our pilot talk. program, we're working on a remote desktop solution yeah. that will allow our engineers to participate fully in open source communities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when I when I said that like we've taken our first steps, uh, by no means am I saying that we have completed that journey, but we have a pilot program identified where we're where we're taking these steps now, and so. Um, Hopefully, fall. I, well, eh. yeah, no. <laughs> but, but yeah, the pilot to. program is, has started. Um, I'm hoping to see like expansion the rest of this year, and then by ne this time next year, we'll have like a full, you know, full number of people uh, participating upstream. Mm -hmm. so. Sort of a similar question I was going to ask. Uh, I guess your biggest hurdle was in driving adoption of this idea. Uh, and how you overcame it, but it sounds like you're still kind of driving towards that. Yeah. But we did have quite a few folks that, you know, from that higher level that really signed on to this process and they said yes. Yeah, we, we've you know? had really good Crazy. backing and support mm -hmm. from our CIO and CTO uh, fully on board with, uh, with us going forward. It, it really helps a lot. So I'm going to go you first and then you in the back. So. The quantification to the business is really simple when you get into it because yeah. it's, hey, you're spending a lot of time having to deal with these things. What would you say to not having to do that? And that's a very easy argument to yeah. make. It's like your development is halted, essentially, and you can't move forward unless this solution comes into place, and that helps justify that argument. That risk the yep. Yeah. And then, yes, you in the back. Yep. Oh. So I do work, I, raise of hands, who is familiar with the to-do group, the talk openly, develop openly group? Part of the Linux Foundation. Part, part of the Linux Foundation, fantastic. This is a great group, and they, so if you are not familiar with them, please go check them out. We have uh, patterns that we essentially do publish with what we can share as well as inner source commons where we get a lot of our content too but in their github repository there's lots of different patterns there where you can mimic without any sort of um patent copyright infringement and things like that and if you all have a great idea that would be a great pattern to share you could submit a pull request and if you have never submitted a pull request before this could be your first time so yeah the to-do group really great community and we'd love to publish what we what we can yeah. there whenever we're but we can chat. Cool. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we have time. How many time? One more. One okay. More. Yes. You... Sure. So, out of curiosity, is there like any sort of limits to the scope of what you're looking to add in the open source wise? Like, are we going to see a many component library, or is this more of a targeted? Right now, it's targeted because it's the most immediate mm -hmm. components we need to address. I'm sure there'll be others that our engineers will find that we'll add to the mix, but this is kind of where we can get, you know, if we can get other participants um, from a, you know, 
out in the open, then I, we, there's no reason why we can't expand according to you know the needs of engineers out there that want to um, mm -hmm. want to get involved. So, yeah. Yeah, we're out there. Join us. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. You Thank can have you. lunch now. <laughs> Thank you.